if we think back to monarchs of the past, you know, war is absolutely central to their identity. By the First and Second World War, the role of monarchs in wartime had changed. George VI and Queen Elizabeth were very much aware that World War II was not just fighting on the battlefield, it was also a propaganda fight. Tonight, how the Second World War redefined our royal family. We hear how the king and queen mother barely escaped with their lives during the Blitz. At 11 o'clock in the morning, a German bomber appeared from nowhere, flew over Admiralty Arch and down the mountain, straight into the palace, and dropped a series of bombs on the palace, one of which very nearly killed the king. How the royal family were just like the rest of us during the Second World War and got stuck into the war effort. This is the queen with grease on her. I mean, this isn't just her with white gloves on opening, you know, hospitals. The Queen Mother famously said, you know, we have sparking plugs for breakfast. For the first time, we hear previously unheard recordings from one of the royal family's secret World War II Army Protection Officers. It was so top secret that we couldn't talk to anybody, couldn't be seen by anybody. And the new relationship that blossomed between the royal family and the British public. From the low point of the abdication, when they'd been called for republic, here we are just four years later, and the king has somehow come to represent the whole spirit of the country, that resilience, that fighting spirit, that we can do it. In the 1930s, the world was heading towards an inevitable war, and Britain had a new king. George VI and his young family were rebuilding public confidence in the monarchy after the shock abdication of his elder brother. Now the king faced an even greater challenge. This was an incredibly difficult testing time. Nazi aggression was really becoming something that just couldn't be ignored. The king didn't know whether he was going to have to be a leader in a time of crisis, a war leader. You know, we were pursuing a policy of appeasement. But with each crisis, we seemed to be coming ever closer to the brink of war. Just at the moment when the British monarchy looked like it was back on its feet, the nation, Europe, was plunged into spectacular crisis. On the 3rd of September, 1939, the king addressed the nation to announce the country was at war. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. As he spoke, the words were hesitant, and there were long gaps, and the delivery was flat. Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, wrote in his diary another speech. It looks as though it's symbolic of the whole country, a sign of weakness. This would prove to be a miscalculation by Germany. King George VI was far from weak. As a young prince, he had fought for king and country. He was no stranger to the theater of war. The king, of course, himself was a military man. He'd served in the First World War. He was a 20-year-old on HMS Collingwood during the Battle of Jutland in 1916. So he actually had wartime experience. In fact, he's the only 20th century monarch to have fought in a conflict zone. And then he finds himself in 1939 in charge of a country that, in many respects, isn't ready for war. And he leads from the front. Now king, George had no active military role, but he was determined to support troops fighting in his name. Once the war actually really moves into its ascendancy with the German attack from May 1940 onwards, he dedicates himself relentlessly to maintaining national morale. The king and his family were soon to prove to the British public that they would stand by them. They would face the hardships of war together. Suddenly Britain was galvanized and to be on a war footing. And what was very, very impressive at the time is that the king and the queen stayed. Many aristocrats in Britain fled when they heard that war was imminent. And they said to the king and queen, you should go too, you should go to Canada where you'll be completely safe. And they said no. The Queen made an announcement that children won't go without me, I won't leave the King, and the King would never leave under any circumstances. The royal family embarked upon their own mission to raise the morale of the troops and of the public. They visited factories, they visited munitions, they visited troops all over the country. By all reports, the days that followed, productivity rates went up. There was a real sense that they 
and galvanized people and given them a sort of new sense of vigor. Sequel to the Big Blitz, the visit of their majesties the King and Queen to districts in East London, which suffered very severely. George VI and Queen Elizabeth were very much aware that World War II was not just fighting on the battlefield, it was also a propaganda fight. When they went around these bomb sites, people were just amazed. There was the Queen in all her jewelry and her furs. And on one occasion, there was a little dog who was half buried under rubble. And the dog was absolutely terrified. And no one could get it out. And the Queen knelt down and she coaxed that little dog out of the hole. I mean, then there was cheers from all the crowd. And it's just little things like... ...was not the only focus for the Luftwaffe. Coventry in the West Midlands had suffered a number of small attacks. On the evening of the 14th of November 1940, 500 German bombers flew over the city, dropping their bombs. The city, having been mercilessly bombed throughout a whole night without regard to military targets, now presents a grim appearance of devastation. Hundreds of civilians lost their lives. I mean, it was more intense bombing than anyone had yet experienced. In fact, Goebbels introduced a new word in the lexicon of horror to coventrate, because 500 tons of um, high explosive bombs were dropped in one night. The city was just a blaze, it was a torch. You could see it 100 miles away. Nearly 600 people killed, and he was there immediately after to visit what was left. And apparently there's a story that um, these dazed, blitzed people who sort of had been bombed only a short time before all broke out into singing the national anthem. And remarkable man. The royal family's decision to remain in Britain meant that they were a direct target for the Third Reich. Though they were heavily guarded, George VI was keen to make sure that they could protect themselves if need be. The king insisted that everybody be trained in how to fire pistols and rifles. Both he and Queen Elizabeth trained every day by all accounts. The Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth, she used to practice by shooting rats and was very proficient at targeting rats. She was not just this kind of like passive you know, wife of the monarch. She was there going, you know, I might not be on the front line, but if you guys come into my back garden, I'm going to be ready for you. So there was a real sense of her being this kind of domestic warrior, and no one wanted to mess with her. Not for nothing did Hitler describe her as the most dangerous woman in Europe. As the conflict continued, it became clear that this was not just a war on the front lines. At home, the king and queen were finding other ways to stop Hitler breaking the spirit of the country by standing resolute with their people during the Blitz, putting their own lives at risk. She saw two bombs falling just outside the window. They heard the explosion. Then there was a great shower up of smoke and debris, and they sort of threw themselves out into the corridor. Buckingham Palace was being bombed. During the Second World War, the royal family were determined to show that they were not just privileged aristocrats. They were at one with the public. They would not run and hide, and they too would feel the struggle. The for this monarchy to be seen as a family, without the kind of trappings of power and pageantry, and that was very much what George VI, Queen Elizabeth, and those around them in the palace pushed as the image. It was a normal domestic family facing the war, the austerity of the war, the fears of the war, the crisis of the war, the danger of the war, just like everybody else. From the low point of the abdication, when they've been called for republic, here we are just four years later, and the king has somehow come to represent the whole spirit of the country, that resilience, that fighting spirit, that we can do it. He's somehow come to epitomize that. It wasn't simply propaganda. The royal family were living the war like millions of other families in the UK. But unlike everyone else, they were individual targets for the Nazis. Decisions and plans had to be made. Losing the British royal family was unthinkable. In May of 1940, there's a sudden realization that Britain's security is actually now under threat. And this is when, for the first time, you have this idea of evacuating the monarchy away from 
to the area which potentially would be the safest if there was a German attack. It's actually Worcestershire, it's about the furthest away from the coast. And also it was deemed to be the best in terms of communication. And with that, a force would be specifically created in secret and their role was to, in the event of an invasion, protect their own family, to move them out of London to one of these other safe places. Formed in the summer of 1940, this group had access to anything that they needed. The king and queen were supposed to have a little suitcase packed and ready at all times to go. And if they were in Buckingham Palace and the worst happened or the invasion began, they would be bundled into the first ever bulletproof car in the UK, along with a number of armoured cars. As one of the men involved said, they were hugely honoured to have been given this mission, but they knew that their role in the event of the worst case scenario was to fight to the last man. Professor Andrew Stewart spoke with one of those men charged with protecting the royals, Sir Geoffrey Darrell, before his death in 2013. He gave an incredible insight into how they prepared to keep the family safe in recordings never previously heard. On the code word Cromwell, we packed up and went straight in our buses. It was so top secret that we couldn't talk to anybody, couldn't be seen by anybody. Mike Tomping saw them when they at Windsor. He took the princesses for a ride in the armoured cars that they were going to be in if they had to go to one of the houses. As the Nazi forces increased, the royal family too moved the young princesses to a safer location, Windsor Castle. The future monarch and her sister were repeatedly drilled in what to do if the castle came under attack. For the initial period, they actually, they sheltered in the dungeons because they were the most secure part of the castle. The Queen's protection officer during the war, Sir Geoffrey Darrell, highlights the real danger the young women were facing. If we had been invaded, the only thing that could have happened, I think, would have been an airborne landing. The Germans would have had to have done it in the dark, grabbed them and taken them away before daylight. And I don't think they could have done it. Princess might have been sent to Canada, I think. It's known the drill of getting them from their bedrooms down to the air raid shelters was practiced. They were given a special bag into which their favorite toys were put. They practiced the idea of how to get ready quickly, uh, so much so that they were able to do it in no time at all. Windsor Castle was a fortress. It was cold and dark. But the queen and her younger sister still had a bit of fun. The king actually had a very good idea. He was going around Windsor Castle with his eldest daughter, Princess Elizabeth. And there was lots and lots of clothes and costumes. And he said, why don't we put on a pantomime? and it gave them something to focus on together. Actually, during the five years of the war, I think they put on four pantomimes, and they were fee-paying. So all the local people used to come as well. And Princess Elizabeth said, oh, we can't charge seven shillings and sixpence for people to come and see us in a pantomime. And Margaret said, they'd pay anything to see us. As the war raged on, German forces disrupted the food supply chain into Britain. The whole country was put on rations in 1940. The royal family were no exception. They did make sure that they had rations. They did have a line around the bath, so that above which you should not go because heating water was obviously a very, very expensive business. The Minister of Supply wants more scrap iron to turn into guns and tanks. Mr. Hicks of the Ministry of Works himself took a hand on some of the Buckingham Palace railings, the removal of which had been ordered by the king. That was part of the whole royal principle throughout World War II, that they should behave in the same way as everyone else. The girls should be evacuated and that the royals should have rations just like everyone else. They should be subject to rationed foods exactly the same way as everyone else. The British royal family remained in their own country, but the war had displaced other European monarchs. The king and queen mother hosted the royal refugees. And the king used to say, don't worry, I've got lots of socks, I've got lots of clothes, I'll kick you out. Actually, a lot of them just sort of looked like ordinary people and, you know, a cleaning lady, they weren't in their robes or pearls or jewels because they didn't have them. And the queen of Sweden was here. Wearing such humble attire, the Swedish queen realized that if anything happened to her, no one would know who she really was. 
because she had a bit of card made and she put it in her purse whenever she was on public transport and it said, I am the Queen of Sweden. Families across the country were facing the loss of loved ones. Over 450,000 British lives were taken in the war. While the senior royals were not in active service, the king's brother, Prince George, the Duke of Kent, was serving in the RAF. He was tragically killed in a plane crash while on duty. It brought home just the tragic losses that basically everybody was not far removed from. Most people in their families, of course, had lost someone, and the royal family, in that sense, were no different. Well, this is what Queen Mary said, you know, everybody is losing family. We can't break down. We have to be strong and set an example. Now we've lost some family too. So many people had lost husbands, sons, brothers. They didn't feel they could call attention to their loss. Uh, it was just a very small funeral. And there's a very evocative description by Noel Coward, because when uh, everyone was trying so hard to control their grief, when the coffin was brought in with his RAF cap on it, Noel Coward says he could feel his face. He was just had tears rolling down his cheeks, and he was relieved to see that the King and Mountbatten were exactly the same. Aerial bombing raids were happening across the country. London was bombed more heavily and more often than other cities. Now, civilians were in Hitler's sights. They thought if there was continuous bombing of London, they would drive the civilian population mad and Britain would surrender. And on the 7th of September, 1940, the largest aerial formation ever seen darkened the skies coming across the English Channel towards London. And suddenly, the East End was ablaze. Buckingham Palace was a key target for the German Luftwaffe. The palace was hit repeatedly during the Blitz. Buckingham Palace was actually bombed 16 times during the war, and of those 16 times, nine of the actual bombing raids caused damage, uh, one of which on Friday the 13th of September 1940 very nearly killed the king. At 11 o'clock in the morning, a German bomber appeared from nowhere, dropped below the clouds, flew over Admiralty Arch and down the mall, dropped a series of bombs on the palace. The king was with the queen and his private secretary in his private sitting room, just getting ready for the day's work and they saw two bombs falling just outside the window. They heard the explosion. Then there was a great sort of shower up of smoke and, and debris, and they just had time to register, you know, that things were very wrong, and they sort of threw themselves out into the corridor and only afterwards realized just what exactly was happening, that Buckingham Palace was being bombed. The precise nature of the attack led the king himself to wonder if his own family in Germany were behind the bombing. In fact, it was suggested that the only way that that aircraft could have carried out the attack was if it was somebody who had an intimate knowledge uh, of, the, uh, of the palace. Uh, and in fact, for a long time, the suggestion was it was a uh, gentleman called Prince Christoph of Hesse, who was a distant relative, but had visited the palace a number of times prior to the war. This was a turning point for the royal family and his relationship with the British public. They did something unprecedented. The media were actually invited into Buckingham Palace and were shown around the damage and were told the story of what had happened. This was revelatory. This had not happened before. The latest outrage of the Nazis' indiscriminate fury is the bombing of Buckingham Palace. Remember, most people hadn't seen the inside of Buckingham Palace. They showed the brickwork that's fallen apart, all the masonry that had been left, and the danger there was to the king and queen. So I think people felt OK, they're going through a slightly better version of the war than we are. They weren't going to the tube every night to hide, but they were suffering from the same problems. They stood for something. It meant something to people that they were still there in the midst of all this. The king and queen had changed the way the royal family interacted with the public. No longer were they closed off. Now they were out and about being seen, commiserating, consoling and encouraging the war effort. Buckingham Palace did take nine direct hits, a policeman was killed, and the Queen, she said, now I can look the East End in the face. And she felt very strongly that because her home had been bombed, it put on the same level as all these people who'd suffered so much. And we do see a change and a lot more support for the royals after this moment. 
The Queen was also keen to let the rest of the world see what was happening in Britain. Before the United States had joined the Second World War, she sent an invitation to the First Lady. The King and Queen were at Paddington Station to greet her in the name of the people of Britain as she arrived in London. One of the most important things the Queen Mother did during the war was to invite Mrs. Roosevelt over to England. So, so much of the damage caused by the big fire raid on the city. You get a real sense that, um, you know, austerity was happening even in Buckingham Palace, reading her account. Queen Elizabeth had moved out of her rooms to give her guest her, her rooms, and they were palatial but bracingly cold. You could see your breath. There was one little electric fire with just a thin orange glow. The glass had all been blown out and was replaced by a cheap substitute. And then when Eleanor Roosevelt went down to the dining room, uh, you know, it all looked very promising, beautiful ambiance and lots of gold and silver. But the food when it came was, was meager and unrecognizable as food for someone not used to wartime substitutes. In fact, she wasn't quite sure what she was eating. Everything's boarded up and there's nothing very grand about Buckingham Palace. It's sort of, it's all, you know, completely bleak. And so who better to go back and tell the president about what's going on in Britain than his wife? The Queen Mother's clever diplomacy brought the reality and horrors of the war to the United States. It cemented the special relationship between the two countries. And now it was time for the next generation to step forward and take the lead. Every Allied newspaper had a picture of the future queen and her spanner and her ambulance. I mean, this was really quite feared because look at this. She's ready. She's out there. She'll go to the front and she'll risk her life if she has to for the war effort. Historically, kings and queens were conquerors, bringing back the spoils of war. Monarchs like Henry IV and George II were seen on the front line. The monarchy really had always in history been about military pursuits. I mean, that was really, you became monarch through military might, and one of the kind of key aspects of being monarch was defense and being seen to lead an army into war. I mean, if we think back to monarchs of the past, you know, war is absolutely central to their identity. By the Second World War, things had changed, and it was the battle on the home front that would win public support. With George VI, it wasn't that he was going to be on the front line with the troops, leading uh, troops into battle, but he was seen to kind of shore up the home front. And in that sense, he had a very active role in the, in the war. He was part of the forces, even though he wasn't actually fighting. War was raging across Europe, and the king and queen mother remained in London with their daughters safe in Windsor. The queen and her younger sister, Margaret, were growing up and wanted to be more involved in the war effort. At just 14 years old, the queen reached out to other children across the empire. She did away from their parents, you know, again, just like her mother, really, saying, you know, come on, guys, we've got to step up, we've got to, we've got to steal ourselves, we've got to do the right thing for the right cause here, you know, be brave, be brave. My sister and I, all of us children who are still at home, think continually of our friends and relations who have gone overseas, who have traveled thousands of miles to find a wartime home and a kindly welcome in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the United States of America. We know, every one of us, that in the end, all will be well. For God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. It's one of the first public things that she ever did, and Princess Margaret chirps in at the end to say goodnight to them. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. Children, of course lost family and they they did a charming broadcast and it was also sent to america because that time we were still trying to entice america into being on our side the queen soon took on other public duties on the 21st of april 1942 she turned 16 and was appointed colonel-in-chief of the grenadier guards by her father that same day she made her first official public appearance as she inspected her troops 
She was only a child when war broke out, really very young, and she had to grow up without her parents, but also expected, really from quite a young age, to take on a leadership role. That was her first big responsibility, and so she took a great interest in her regiment and, um, you know, very much involved with, with their activities. In 1945, aged 18, the Queen insisted on joining the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the women's branch of the British Army. Women were suddenly supposed to go to work, to go to the factories, to be, learn to be mechanics while the men were away fighting. And, you know, the Queen and uh, Princess Elizabeth were like, well, I'm just going to do the same thing. And so it was very much, you know, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us, and we're no different. We don't require special treatment. She was absolutely determined that she would go out there and join in with other girls. Even if she couldn't do it, even if it was difficult, even if she made a fool of herself, she didn't care. She wanted to go out there and do her duty. George VI had said, hold on a second, no, 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 this is not a job for you. And Princess Elizabeth, of course, our current queen, was like, absolutely not. I'm rolling my sleeves up. I want to join. I want to enter the war effort. And of course, she did. And we see that amazing footage of her. Well, she had to undergo six weeks of training. And six weeks of training were all about trucks, because that's what the ATS did. They drove people around troops, bits of equipment, whatever the army needed, round in trucks. The Queen Mother famously said, you know, we have sparking plugs for breakfast, you know, so the Queen was obviously very interested in all that. The Queen rose quickly through the ranks. In a matter of months, she was promoted to junior commander, the equivalent of army captain. She just seems to be this sort of ageless icon. But when you look at her role in the war, she was this attractive woman, but a kind of active woman who was dressed in khakis, who was dressed in overalls. This is the queen with grease on her. I mean, this isn't just her with white gloves on opening, you know, hospitals or, you know, unveiling plaques. This is her actually doing a job of work. She served, she was the first, you know, woman royal to be in the armed forces. So she led from the front. She delivered and she did what she needed to do. And I suppose she's lived that out ever since and her remarkable longevity and sense of duty. And I think the Queen never took the easy path. And it would have been quite easy for her not to join the ATS to stay in Windsor Castle with Margaret. Images of the future Queen in overalls driving large vehicles were widely distributed and became a powerful propaganda tool. The picture of the young Queen in her ATS uniform training for this difficult, dangerous work, I mean, that really cannot be underestimated what effect it had on the morale of the people and also on the morale of the enemy. The fact that the future queen was not protected, not wrapped in cotton wool, that she'd suffered bombings, that she'd been through it all, and now here she was, training to go out on the front. Every Allied newspaper had a picture of the future queen and her spanner and her ambulance. I mean, this was really quite feared because look at this. She's ready. She's out there. She'll go to the front and she'll risk her life if she has to for the war effort. She's always said she had a very happy time meeting other girls who'd volunteered and worked for the ATS. And in a strange way, a lot of people of that age say some of their happiest moments were in the war when suddenly urgency and being useful were very important, whereas before women, not many had worked, many were just sitting around waiting to do something. But she qualified and drove her lorry into London She'd learnt to strip down an engine, she'd learnt to change a wheel, she'd learnt to drive a he heavy lorry and how to load it. And uh, she proudly drove into London. Apparently, she went round Piccadilly Circus twice. Wasn't sure how the roundabout worked. It wasn't all work and duty for the Queen. Romance was blossoming. Her future husband was on the front line serving... Philip of Greece, when she was 13 and he was 18 at Dartmouth Naval College, he was a top cadet, he was going off to war, and he was absolutely charming to her. She records that they went for tea on the Royal Yacht, because, of course, they're related. And after tea, the Royal Yacht sailed away, and all the cadets followed in their boats, but Prince Philip was the last one to turn back, and the king had to actually command him to go. He was a distant relation. He was produced on that occasion to, to look after the two princesses, and that's always where they say they, they focused on each other. And, of course, he had a very, very good war. He described to me once that during the war, I mean, he had no family, no family in England. His mother was living in Greece, and, of course, he was Greek. And there was a certain wish or wonder, would he join the Greek Navy? But he, A, decided that he'd done a
some training in Britain. And of course, he lived in Britain because his family had been exiled. And the Greek Navy was very small, and I think he thought he wouldn't see much action, so he joined the British Navy. He kept in touch with Queen Elizabeth during that time. In fact, she had a, a photograph of a naval officer with a beard uh, on, her, on her table, and that was Prince Philip. He had a beard in those days, but I didn't think it fooled anybody, but um, he was slightly disguised, I suppose. The war creates and cements the romance between Philip and Elizabeth. They don't see each other much, but they think about each other a lot. In July 1942, while second in command of HMS Wallace, Philip made history when he devised a plan that would save all on board. He was to become a war hero. Philip played a really Im immensely important role uh, in the war in various ways, but perhaps no more so than the Allied invasion of Sicily when there was a real danger that his ship was going to be bombed by the German Air Force. And so he came up with the idea of basically sending or throwing off the ship a raft and sort of lighting the raft and using that as a decoy and drawing um, the German bombers to that target whilst the warship moved away. And this was by the accounts, re relatively recent accounts of those on the ship said there's no uh, doubt in the minds of many of those who served on that ship and who are alive today that, you know, Prince Philip's quick thinking saved the lives of the men on the ship and, and saved the warship. So he was, you know, quite the hero. The Second World War created many heroes and the king would find a way to honor them all. None were more deserving than the people of Malta, where, despite personal risk, the king visited to express a nation's gratitude. Malta, that little island in the middle of the Mediterranean, was very strategically sited for airfields and harbors to support the North African war, and as a result, it had ended up being one of the most bombed places on earth, and it's a quarter of a million people desperately hungry. And the king wanted to acknowledge their bravery and their valor. With the enemy just 60 miles away, the king arrived in Malta on the 20th of June, 1943. There is this simply wonderful moment when finally he can get there. And it's a beautiful morning. Even at a distance, he can hear that word has spread that the whole jetty of the Grand Harbour and Valletta is absolutely crammed with people, cheering, shouting and waving. And the king is a solitary figure, slight figure in a white uniform on the bridge of HMS Aurora giving the salute. And as he approaches, the roar became tumultuous. People were so pleased. Here was their king. The king stayed the George Cross on the entire island, which had the effect that every fisherman and every man in a boat or every man walking the street felt that he, in a sense, had got the George Cross, you know, as a brave island. He wrote to his mother afterwards, entering that grand harbor of Valletta. It was a moment he would never forget. Finally, the tide of war was turning. The door was being opened to the possibility that we could win, and there was a hit song coming in on a wing and a prayer, which was all about coming in with the engines down and everything's gone wrong, but we're going to get home. And the princesses loved this. There's a gramophone at, at Balmoral, and they played this song over and over with the Queen and danced in the corridors. There was a real sort of lighter mood at last, some possibility of real hope. The Allied forces saw victory on the horizon. Soon, the future Queen and her younger sister would enjoy a rare moment of anonymity, up close and personal with their subjects. The King, who was such a cautious man, he too was so happy, he said, yes, off you go. On the 8th of May, 1945, after six long years, the Prime Minister announced that war had come to an end. The country woke up to the wonder of it all. VE Day, Victory Day, a day like no other, a day they had, you know, been fighting for. VE Day was the day where another radio broadcast addressed from the King, and of course this time the King not saying it's going to be a long and difficult time ahead, stay strong, announcing instead, of course, victory, that the war was over. To Germany, to the enemy who drove all Europe into war has been finally overcome. This led to huge outpourings of national jubilation and adulation for the royal family. And, you know, in the sense that the royal family had been central uh, during the war to the war effort, they were also central to 
Then the crowd makes its way to the Mall. There's 10,000 people milling on the Mall, demanding to see the royal family. <laughs> After years bound by the constraints of war, the future queen and her sister Margaret were desperate to get in amongst the celebrations. This day marked an amazing moment. There were crowds, everyone rushed into the streets. It was this great moment. And the two princesses said to the king and queen, can we go outside with all those people? And the king, who was such a cautious man, he too was so happy. He said, yes, off you go. And that seems unbelievable because it was absolute chaos outside. The young queen went out in her ATS uniform. And initially, she'd pulled her cap down. But then she was told she couldn't go out with the uniform incorrect. She had to put it back up. And she was a bit concerned that people would recognize her. But everyone was so excited and so happy that they just didn't care. And... The Queen actually spoke about this many years later. She talked about how marvellous it was. Everyone swept along in this tide of happiness and relief. And it's an amazing story that Margaret and Elizabeth, they go out there, they're out there in the crowds, these people rushing round, and they shout, God save the King, God save the Queen, with everyone else. <laughs> There was this wonderful moment as dusk fell and Buckingham Palace suddenly was floodlit. Lionel Logue, the King's speech therapist, was outside Buckingham Palace and he could see it all. He said the Queen's tiara caught the lights. It just seemed almost magical, like a fairy land. You know, suddenly there was light and cheering. And it went on for so long, they came in front of the balcony eight times. It just seemed like, in that moment, the quintessential moment of victory. It wasn't just a military victory. It was a personal victory for the king. George VI, for all that he had a stammer, for all that he didn't want the role, for all that he dreaded the role, he had become the war leader, the king the country wanted. So it was an incredible turnaround for the monarchy. The great irony is that George VI was never supposed to be king. And on paper, he did not have the credentials of a king, but he was in fact made for the moment. He was actually exactly what Britain needed at that time. Almost as soon as the war is over, people turn their attention to the princess, to the heir, and her wedding, of course, two years after the end of the war, is all about light and Bieber. Elizabeth is crowned queen just seven years later. Each year, she stands alongside the servicemen and women in solidarity and remembrance as her parents once did. I think it's very moving that we hardly ever see emotion from the Queen, but one occasion is when she was mourning veterans. She served alongside so many other young people, but so many of them are no longer with us. And I think the Queen throughout her reign has been particularly concerned with veterans, how they've suffered with commemorating veterans and commemorating the war, and really that reflects her own experiences of World War II. There's something so authentic about it. There's something that she is living or reliving the experiences that she's had. And there is no doubt that the respect that the Queen commands among a certain generation is because of her having lived through the experiences of World War II shoulder to shoulder with them. The Queen's experiences during the Second World War have undoubtedly shaped her life as a monarch. World War II is absolutely central to an understanding of the Queen, who she is, where she's come from, and why she has the sense of duty and devotion to the realm, to the national spirit. That completely explains it. For the Queen, watching her father step up to the role of king and lead during the Second World War has instilled an unwavering commitment within her. For her, war her character it gave her the belief in sacrifice in frugality and in duty that she would carry through for the rest of her life and try and instill in her children to make them too understand what a sacrifice her generation went through